sylphs. Sylphs all over them. Hey, Captain, where you get that shirt? Oh, I had to kill a fed to get it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is what the normal uh, fish finder screen looks like before they jam it. Uh -huh. Now, when we get out past that point, they're probably going to jam it. It'll be all blank. It won't even show depths or anything. No, nothing. Okay. A photograph of a Polaris missile coming up out of this lake, Lake Ponderé, probably about 20 years ago, probably in the 1980s. And I'm, we're parked at a spot in the lake where we can get a the same angle view of that cliff over there and the power line. And you can see that the trees have grown up quite a bit since this photo was taken. Okay. So it was done before digital Photoshop. And it's over there where I see a lot of white and stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a boat right in the way, huh? And notice the power line going up to the left. Right. It's easier to see in the photo because the trees are shorter. Huh. And now there are houses over there. Before there weren't. There are people living over there now. Okay, well, talk a minute about uh, what's going on with the underground bases and submarines and all that stuff with this lake. Oh, well, in this lake, Steve and I gifted it uh, with 200 tower busters with this boat in November 2006. It's almost two years ago. And uh, it was a flat, calm day in the afternoon. No, no other boats were out except for the Navy, Navy's boats. They were engineers' boats. They were aluminum, and they were trailing sonar. Apparently, they're trying to. They knew we were coming. They were going to track where we dropped all these tower busters. And we were down there, about where you, you see those cliffs over there, offshore, maybe a quarter mile, and a, in this flat lake, a big wave surfaced right next to the boat, about 20 yards away, and tracked us. And we were going 25 miles an hour. And this was a perfectly round wave, like the top of a conning tower of a submarine would push up. And so we whipped over there really quick, got right on top of it, and the wave quickly flattened out because it dove. And you could hear the and feel the engines of that submarine just vibrating the boat. And it was pretty, pretty amazing. There a lot of tales about people seeing submarines surface in this lake, but never in the media. The media wouldn't touch it. So they started a bunch of sea monster stories, the Navy did, back in the 40s to uh, cover up what people were seeing, apparently. And, uh, like Ogopogo, but that didn't really catch on. People aren't that stupid. Okay, these are the earth pipes. Carol figures we need 13 more earth pipes to neutralize this underground underwater base, which is, the bottom of the lake is 1,300 feet. It's the deepest lake around. Uh, so these came out of my crashed airplane. This was, these were the wing spars. I thought it would be appropriate to use my crashed airplane to undo their nasty underground base. So what we do, I cut this spar up, I put earth, cast earth pipe, earth, uh, pipe plugs in there with a simple coil and crystal, and I added fins, and I don't know if you can catch this, but it goes down straight and it sticks in the muck in the bottom of the lake. See? All right. So I'm going to drop one here where the missile came out of the lake. Oh, don't float. Okay, no, it's going down. Oh, it's going. It's going. It's to turn around. Yeah, it's going straight. Oh, God. It went <laughs> Gave your heart a little start. Yes, okay. <laughs> I planned it right. Yeah. That looked good. That was very good. That was yeah. very nice. And it went the, fast. Yeah. The thinner ones went just like a missile, right? Drop them in and they went boom, right down straight. Probably it happened right into the Check out what happens cool. in the sky also <laughs> as, we, as we do this along this 25 mile stretch here. Uh -huh. 20 mile stretch. And uh, let's track what happens in the sky, because uh, last time we gifted here, we put an 18. Look at all the filth. In the lake over, yeah. In the lake over there, the sky was perfectly clear blue. This massive filth formation showed up right over where we put the 18. They, so were, showing the us, they were showing us where to put them. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Irene was with us, too, and she's, she's a pajama person. <laughs> she <laughs> was going, oh, my God. It was pretty, it was pretty neat. <laughs> Gave her a little nudge, eh? To yeah. Wake her up. Well, she's been being nudged. Just about every oh, day. <laughs> the rocks are nudging her nonstop. They're not blocking the sonar now. This shows a bottom at 900 feet, and this shows the fish. So they're not blocking the sonar this time. It's the well, first we're time. not around the corner though yet. Oh, either. we're not out of the bay yet. Right.
Can I tell you about this? This is the only legitimate sonar facility here. What they do is they drag buoys down to the bottom of the lake and release them, and then they station their sonar equipment around to track it. Uh, and, and it's very quiet, as you can imagine, no motor sounds, no bubbles or anything. So, and they have those aluminum boats that were trying to find our tower busters. Their job is to go around the lake and, and determine where this buoy is going. They can control it remotely so it can surface anywhere. And part of the Navy's scam with publishing that missile photo or letting it be published is that they can say, well, this is just our, our buoy that when it comes out of the water, it actually leaves the water and it's like 60 feet long or 90 feet. Wow. And I don't doubt that's true, but uh, that's a Polaris missile. <laughs> <laughs> Rolling like this, thinking there's going to be any minute. Yeah, it's just going to squirt right out of there. Right. You just said that was the water scene. Yeah. That rainbow self up there is very excited with what we're working on today and the colors are a good proof that he is just gushing with emotion. She. Rainbow selfs are always a nice confirmation. Selfs are a good confirmation. Rainbow selfs are like a double whammy. one of the Navy's boats. The Navy has about a dozen of those boats in a shed over in the town of Bayview, close to where we started out. Uh, they usually trail a couple of lines of sonar, probably very deep in the water. They, they act like they're fishing, but they're all middle-aged civil service guys, uh, PhDs, sonar specialists and whatnot. And when Steve and I were here a couple of years ago, I think these guys, they don't look like they're fishing because they're so grumpy and they're giving us dirty looks. And I, I figured out later while well, they were trying to find out where we were dropping these tower busters and that was their job and they didn't like being out there in a cold day so <laughs> but these were feds spying on us in that that uh, aluminum boat uh, what agency were they honey oh, I don't know. Well, probably fatherland security CIA FBI Masodomites all the all the regular geeks anyway but I'm betting that woman was a psychic My, right but these are what did that thing happen to Ryan? Oh. I always do it gradually now. Did you throw him? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, he was sitting in the back and he got a wave came over him. He just sucked all his clothes. Tsunami. <laughs> okay. You ready? You're going to edit this anyway. You're going to oh, make yeah. more work for this guy? He's going to do five hours of video. When 
I stop the boat, they quit jamming the sonar. See? It's got, it's like this is the point where I stopped it right here. I'm going to turn the motor on. You can see if it starts up with just the motor. Yeah. This is my shy wife, Carol. <laughs> We're standing here on our front porch. If you look over that way, if this was 25 years ago, you would have seen that missile come up out of the lake. And it's overcast today, but there's some beautiful mountains over there, and they surround the, the lake, and that's where we were the other day. Uh, lake Pondray was the site of the third largest Navy training center in World War II. It was built right before the war started. And uh, it, this place was incredibly remote then. There weren't even any roads up here. It was all reached by railroad. And this, air, this airstrip apparently was built for the base. We're on the eastern edge of that, where it was. <coughs> and it was a basic training center, boot camp. But right after the war started, a whole bunch of Germans showed up there. Presumably prisoners of war, but they were submariners. And, um, Nobody really knows what they did there, but many people have a sense that it was connected to a big hole in the bottom of the lake where submarines now come up and from the Pacific Ocean. Apparently there is a tunnel system pretty deep on your ground, and several lakes have had uh, submarines surfacing in them, including this one, Lake Coeur d'Alene, Pyramid Lake in Nevada, uh, there's another lake in Nevada with, which has another Navy base. And it's um, also a deep lake. And the Navy always denied that there were any prisoners of war there. Denied it. Until a few years ago, a park ranger, the Navy base is now in a state park. It's called um, <coughs> Farragut State Park, named after Admiral Farragut. I think the Civil War Admiral. And, uh, <clears throat> a park ranger was walking along and he fell through an old floor. They, they removed all the buildings, but apparently in the basement of one building uh, were a bunch of records of the German prisoners. And, and he stumbled on those and somehow it made it into the press. And, uh, uh, I mentioned stories about monsters in this lake, lake monsters like Loch Ness and Ogopogo. The Navy apparently started those after they set up their sonar operations. Uh, I think this was back in the 1960s or so. And apparently they wanted to cover up their activities. Um, this was a very sparsely populated area, so this lake didn't have a lot of boats on it until fairly recently. And so when people started seeing this bizarre stuff in the lake, uh, the Navy had these rumors out there circulating, and they could point to those rumors, telling people they were crazy. It's kind of like how the Air Force and the CIA have tried to persuade everybody that UFOs aren't real since 1947. All right, this is a rowing skull that I built a year and a half ago. It's a really fast, nice boat. Built from a kit I bought in Bellingham, Washington. It's got these oars on it. It's real lightweight and very efficient. It's a lot of fun. This is the airplane I crashed in in May 19th this year. Uh, I built this from a kit at the factory in Nampa, Idaho last year. And I had about 20 hours on it before I crashed it. <coughs> uh, the, I had just flown down to Micah Peak and I disabled one, two, three, four mountaintop arrays in that one flight on the west side of the valley and across the Spokane River to the mountains over there. And I was running out of gas, which I knew I would, so I picked a big field to land in and I glided down from the top of the mountain in this huge field. We had a very nice landing. 
filled the fuel tank and started to take off, uh, but there was a down draft from a ridge that was upwind that was constantly sending the air back down to the ground in what they call a rotor. And I, I didn't have enough experience to understand that, so I wasn't getting any lift, so uh, I, I was flying into the wind, but as the wind was coming down, I wasn't getting off the ground very high. And I was about 20, 30 feet up. So I banked to the left to try to get a more favorable wind and immediately lost control. And so I, I was going about 40 miles an hour. I cut the power really quick and the plane just went right down in the ground. You can see it hit the nose and the landing gear, <coughs> broke it up, bent the wing. And I walked away unharmed, and, uh, thankfully. Uh, this is wing I tore up the other, last week to make the earth pipes for Lake Pond Ray. Uh, there was something a little funny about the crash it, that wasn't, didn't seem entirely natural. The wind wasn't very strong that day. It was maybe 10 miles an hour. And that's why it felt safe for me to take off. And um, when the psychics looked at it later on, they said there was a wall of energy around the aircraft. It was like a, a barrier. And, and when I lost control of the plane, I, I, I looked and I was going plenty fast enough to be able to bank it or go up or down and, and nothing happened when I moved the controls. And uh, if I hadn't cut the power, I probably would have hurt myself. I should say too that for two or three weeks before the crash, Carol kept seeing these little dark entities flitting around the property, and and I even saw one in the hangar uh, a couple of days before the crash. And I, I rarely see stuff like that, but this one, about the size of a big dog, and it was just scurrying out of the way into the dark part of the hangar, uh, out of my path. I didn't think a whole lot about it, but after the crash, we didn't see those anymore. So when the psychics looked at it, they said they were Chinese military psychics, kind of like skinwalkers, Navajo tradition. And the Chinese military are, are tied in with the triads. That's some very ancient magic. So uh, the Chinese and the African magic is really old. and Well, I think it's a lot more powerful than the European tr magic is. And, these guys are adept at manipulating the elements just a bit. Not in a big dramatic way, but they can tweak it. And uh, so I think that's what happened in my case. But if I had the experience and better judgment with flying, I wouldn't have put myself in that situation. I would have picked an airfield to land at. So they were able to exploit that, if, if they were exploiting it. I believe they were, but I can't prove it film the zapper making pro process a little bit. She said, you really ought to clean up in there, but I, I was going to do that, but uh, if I did that, you'd think I was a very tidy person. I'm actually not, but we do keep the house very tidy. And these are the circuits I get from Mark Strong in Philadelphia. Uh, you want to close up? Yeah. I get it made up in boards like this. He right. sells me a couple thousand at a time, and I put the, I solder the battery clip on there for the nine volt battery, and these are the boxes. I attached the copper discs. I used to use pennies for the political statement, and I had the um, English penny, head penny, for the positive electrode, and had an image of Queen Elizabeth on there, and I thought, well, she never worked a day in her life. Why can't she do something useful instead of being a parasite? So uh, that worked for a while, but I gradually figured out that a smooth electrode is a little more efficient. I made it a little bit larger, too. And I put a garnet in the positive electrode line 
and an amethyst in the negative ground electrode line. The amethyst rela relates to the this part of the energy field. The garnet relates to the lower part. And this gives you a full spectrum effect. Then I put an organite plug, organite plug, in here like that. The electricity, the wire goes under the plug and then out to an, a Mobius coil. This is a Mobius coil. That's how I, I make them on a rack and make them round. That goes in the circuit down here by the ground electrode. So the energy comes from the battery. It goes through the circuit to make it pulse at approximately 15 cycles a second. And uh, energy, when it goes past the subtle energy components, the electric, electric current picks up their qualities, which is a nice thing to do, create a little synergy. And this, there's a magnet that goes in the bottom. You know, one of these magnets here, they're rear earth magnets. And when it's all done, this is how it looks. See, there's the magnet with a Mobius coil around it, right. amethyst, garnet. The wire goes under this organite block. And this is very important. There's a, a wire. See that red wire there? That surrounds everything, but especially the Mobius coil. If you don't put a containment wire around a Mobius coil, it can, um, the Mobius coil can make you feel kind of sick. At this size and at this amount of current, it's not going to harm you, but, but uh, Carol and I think that the Death Towers have huge Mobius coils in them, powered by nuclear generated electricity, you know, thousands of volts. And the reason you need to put them so close together is because the field effect from these death transmitters is kind of short. And so they put them in neighborhoods and tell people that they're for cell phones. But people are figuring out that these are not for cell phones. They're military in installations with fortified bunkers housing alternate generators. But the power comes up from underground, obviously. There's a guy, one of the gifters in New Jersey, works in a place that supplies power boxes to the death tower installations, and they only handle 220 volts, like a house. Now, if you look at the fat cables that go up all these masts, they're obviously handling thousands, or even perhaps millions of volts. It's not a house current situation. And the power has to come from somewhere. You never hear the generators running. So yeah, it comes from underground. And if you hunt around where you live, you can find these rectangular ponds lined by gravel. And sometimes they're called sewage treatment ponds or water settling ponds, but they're obviously not that. If you look at a settling pond or a sewage treatment pond, they're huge, they stink, and they have slime in them. These are always very, very clean. And one pond is filled while the other one's empty. And if you go back again, the other one will be full, and the, other, and the first one will be empty. That's because they have to cool nuclear generators or it, in addition to cooling, they, they bring the dead orgone up to the surface to dissipate in the air. If they try to cool it in the ground, they're going to poison themselves. You know, nearly everybody who works in nuclear power plants gets cancer. And that's because of the deadly orgone radiation. It's not because of uh, electromagnetic radiation. So they know that. And apparently these nukes they use to power the towers are the same kind that they use in submarines. They're very small, very efficient. But they generate a lot of deadly orgon. So. Uh, in, this, in this organite block here, we put gemstones. We put a proprietary combination of gemstones. And, and you know, people copy us, so I, I don't talk about what's in there. And same with Carol. She doesn't talk about the stones she puts in her products because a lot of people are making a living selling this stuff, and we would like to keep a little bit of an edge, competitive edge. Um, so A lot of people ask about using house current converters to power their zappers, like when they're sleeping. And, and I did that years and years ago, and I'd wake up in the morning feeling kind of crummy and 
somebody explained to me that that's because the 60 hertz frequency of house current, 50 to 60 hertz, is debilitating. And that transfers right through to the zapper, right into your body. And that's why uh, people that sell zappers that plug into the wall, they get a lot of complaints by people who say they get sick from it. And I know they don't really get sick, they just feel like they're sick. But they're probably actually getting well. But uh, if you want to wear a zapper around the clock, the only way to do it is to put a battery in it and stick it on your body. And that's the way to get the most out of any zapper. Our zapper had, generates a field effect because of Mobius coil and the magnet and the organite block. And um, so in addition to killing all of the pathogenic organisms and neutralizing poisons in the body, uh, you get the ben local, localized benefit of this field effect, which is very, very strong healing orgone. Uh, so if you have, well, if somebody has a lot of intestinal parasites, they can kill them a lot quicker wearing the zapper on their abdomen than if they wear it on their shoulder or in their sock. And it, that gets the job done, but you can get it all done no matter how many worms you've got in your guts, it, they'll kill them all within about five days. A lot of people have worms, lots and lots of people, especially kids. Uh, oh, rechargeable batteries. The, the old rechargeables are not very good. You have to, they're good for about 10 hours of zapping. Then the voltage drops so low that you, you really need to recharge every day. There's a new form of battery called lithium polymer that's rechargeable and carries the voltage about as long as an alkaline battery, which is about two weeks of constant zapping for an alkaline battery. Uh, Carol and I met in 1997. I was living in my broken down 1981 Honda Civic, and I was visiting my brother, Jim, in uh, Santa, Idaho. Yeah, it helps. Oh, this is Carol's daughter, Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Yeah? <laughs> I got interested in subtle energy effects through my second wife, X2, I'll call her, who was very adept at uh, formulating flower essences, and, and uh, she had a very good rapport with elementals, and I had some interesting experiences with that, thanks to her. Uh, later on, I met James Hughes in Ashland, Oregon, and he instructed me and, and um, taught me a lot of stuff and did a treatment on me that opened up a lot of my capability. I'm not a psychic. I'm not very energy sensitive, but everybody has intuitive capabilities. And this relates to discernment. And uh, I found it a lot e easier to sift through all the bull crap out there in the metaphysical community after I was spent some time with James. And it was after that that Carol and I got together, not long after that. Um, orgone is what Wilhelm Reich calls subtle energy. Uh, just about everybody else calls it something else. The Chinese call it qi, Japanese call it ki, some people call it life force, the Indians call it prana. But it's all the same energy, it's the matrix of the universe from which matter and energy are created. And uh, we can manipulate this. Dr. Reich was the first scientist to do it in a quantitative way. And he, he is the pioneer in this field. And so we dedicate our work to him. We try to follow his example in terms of intellectual integrity, um, the fo focusing on the work and not the ideologies. And uh, that, that's really helped us in this network, a lot of us in this network. It's, it's an informal network. It's not organized. In fact, most of the people who talk about this stuff on the web are not people that we care associate with. Bradley was an enormous help to this movement in the first couple of years. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him. Carol and I did. He developed the film Cloud Busters, uh, um, Chemtrails, Clouds of Death. Don Bradley doesn't like his name mentioned much, but he's the DB we talk about all the time. And uh, uh, he's got good reasons for that, and so I'm not going to go into that too much. But he, 
He was such an enormous help. He's the guy that mostly got rid of the smog in L.A. Most of that was done by him, by himself, with tens of thousands of tower busters and thousands and thousands of miles, miles of driving over a period of about three years. Um, part of the disinformation that's out there directs people's attention to the crystal element in the organite. They want people to assume that, that the crystals are doing the work. Uh, but in fact, this can all be done without any crystals at all. It's just that adding crystals enables us to do it with less organite. The, the proper use of specialized crystals, gems, coils, metals, is in the personal devices. And there are a lot of really good vendors out there who are making very fine products for personal use, just to keep in your home. And these interact with you. So any qualities that a crystal has or a gem has is magnified by organite. And when you combine them in an intelligent way, they create a synergy that's much more powerful than the sum of the parts. Now, this is something uh, my wife started. Carol started this, but a lot of very gifted people have gotten into it, and, and I hope there's going to be more dialogue about that, intelligent discussion about that, and sharing. Most people, myself included, will probably never be interested in doing much of this because we're not energy sensitive or psychic. So I, I'm content. When I want to do something special, I just ask Carol what to stick in there, and, and uh, I do what she says. All right, six Always years ago, out. in July 2002, uh, we started having our regular, ch uh, we call them chat blast sessions. And, and it started out very informally. It was just DB and Carol and I. Uh, and uh, in July 3rd, 2002, a gifter near Chicago was in meditation and he got an image of a nuclear bomb blowing up on the waterfront during the fireworks, July 4th fireworks. And he had this a couple of days before. He contacted me, I contacted Bradley, and, and we got together and Carol and Don went out of body and started hunting around. They found a nuclear device uh, about to be triggered by the CIA. And they neutralized it. So it didn't go off. And I sh that was the first time. And after that, we've just about every week, we've psychics have gone hunting for more mass murder plots by the world order. And of course, the United States is the primary terrorist organization. They're the ones that commit most of the mayhem in the world. And they blame the Muslims or whoever. Whenever a person be. decides to do some good in this world, he's going to have some opposition. And in our case, we're opposed by every sewer rat agency on the planet, no matter where we travel. Uh, when we were in Florida, I uh, got a Ken doll and I did him up like this because that was the worst trouble we had ever had with feds. The FBI killed my dog and they were just all over us. They even sent a SWAT team one time. We just got sick of it. So we also got this thing. <coughs> we also got this. And I keep it by the bed. And they know that. It's lo unloaded. I'm, I don't even like to shoot the thing. They don't know that. They don't believe me when I say that. So, But it stops them from coming into our bedroom at night. And uh, I'm facing the front door. This is the first thing they see when they come in. So I know it puts them off balance a little bit. You can't stop them from coming in your house because they can unlock any door. And they can even materialize. They have that technology. And I was thinking of putting fly paper around when it got really bad one time during one period. They kept showing up in the hallway. and. and but I didn't do it. Uh, speaking of opposition, the most horrific thing we've had to deal with has been infiltration and sabotage. And three years ago, five years ago, I opted to make a forum that was by invitation only because all of my time before that in these open membership forums were was taken up with countering the the attacks of, of uh, slanderers who would, you know, distract everybody from the work. And, 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 and the only way to get rid of that problem 
is to only allow people in, into a forum who are focused on the work. And if you look at ethericwarriors.com, you can see that most people don't believe the way I do. And why should they? But we all have in common something that's more important, and that's the healing effects of Organite and how we can develop more ways to uh, generate these effects. So the people that detract from, from us are the ones that I, I haven't invited. And they set up entire websites to slander uh, some of us, especially me. And I think they go after me because I do most of the talking, that's all. I love Don Croft's Zapper, the Terminator 2 Zapper. I cannot believe how much business I've created for you. <laughs> and, and what I love about these two is they're so humble and they're so beautiful, right? They just, they really, these are Americans, folks, right? This is what's really at the heart of America makes America great. It, I'm sure you're tinkering in that garage all the time. Is this true? I don't see him from the time he gets up until he comes back, back at dinner time, when his when his stomach starts to rumble. <laughs> That's American ingenuity, isn't it? So maybe you could tell us how did you get into zappers, Don? What was the first thing? Um, 1995. I was sickened by a chemtrail in San Bernardino, experimental chemtrail, and I knew what it was because I listened to our bell. Well, can you hear? Oh, so uh, I didn't know if I'd be affected. The next day I started coughing and I stayed sick until April when I got my first zapper. I bought a zapper for 125 bucks. It was like Holder Clark's zapper. And I got well in a day from the coughing and the lack of energy, but my depression went away and I felt like a huge balloon lifting up, you know, and the first time in my life. So I couldn't wait to find more sick people to try it on. <laughs> and after about six, des six, about 60 desperately ill people got well in a very short time, I, I knew that the claims had some value, so I started making them and selling them. And uh, that's how I started. And I started improving it. Um, I started, after about a year of making them, just like Hall the Clark did, I, I, I realized it was too cumbersome, and I, I realized these electrodes can probably be closer together, so I started putting in my sock, everything in my sock, and and people had tried it, and they got well just as quick. So I experimented. I put some on, on the box, like this, and I found a dozen people around Seattle who had sinus infections. And every single one of them who tried it got, their sinuses cleared up in 20 minutes from wearing a zapper on their ankle. So I knew that it didn't really matter where you put the thing on your body. I gotta say, the body is full of electrolytes, cerebrospinal fluid, blood, mucus, mu mucosa, uh, lymphatic fluid, everything, urine, feces, it's all conducts electricity. So you can kill the parasites in your brain by zapping on the sole of your foot in 20 minutes. And the first time I zapped an hour and it cured my, killed all the parasites in my brain, which is probably what caused my depression. And I've seen a lot of people throw away their brain drugs after they start zapping. Yeah, that yeah absolutely. That's amazing. I want to turn this over because I, I've been using zappers for years. There's probably a few of you here who's been doing that too, or you're brand new. Is there any questions that anybody has about these zapper devices? Let's go here and then we'll come back to Mr. Quit over here. Um, I'd like to give these as gifts. I just bought one. I think it's wonderful after one night. I want to know if we should be concerned about any precautions, such as if they have sports injuries with plates or nails in their knees or their neck or something like that. that That's a great question. Thanks a lot. It's absolutely impossible to do any harm to anybody with any battery-powered zapper, no matter who makes it. Okay. Absolutely impossible. You can use it on pregnant women, guys with pacemakers, newborn infants. It's all good. It never hurts anybody. Your dog or cat? Your dog or cat? Yeah, we worked on two dogs here this weekend. Your cat will probably go lie down on it if he's not feeling good. And it'll zap a cat through the fur. A dog has to be zapped on the skin. A horse can apparently be zapped through the fur. Uh, some animals. It depends on the nature of the fur. That's all. Okay. Just Tom. Yeah. Could you, could you say a little about voltages, the technology, proof that works, what does it do to these viruses? I mean, I'm trying to get oh, yeah, sure. what, what's it doing to these 
Okay, good. Now this is all hard science. This is, there is no guesswork with this. And it's a very simple process. The, I have a picture on my website, worldwithoutparasites.com, and our website. And it shows some dead worms. These worms came out of the colon of my ex-wife, who uh, used a zapper for the first time during a colonic. She killed a whole bunch of worms. She set, kept a few and took a picture. The, uh, she'd never used a zapper before, and she'd been on the best parasite remedies for about six months without any effect. So when she started crapping out these worms, she's pretty, she kept them. So, and I told her, uh, I'm going to make you famous with this photo, but I won't take you fishing anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but I forgot her last name. I don't know what it is now. So. What about the ionization factor? Because like oh. what's, what's, the voltage is the amplitude, right? The voltage is the amplitude. You're dealing with a square wave form, and then the frequency is, the say, the pulses per second. So maybe we could talk about that and how that affects a virus or a bacteria. Like that's what this fellow asked in the first place. So. <laughs> um, the, what Holocock used to tell about, but she doesn't anymore, is that the zapper works because the square wave pulses electric current onto the skin, and the skin acts as a capacitor. That means it keeps a little bit of the current, and then it bleeds some of the current through. It's been measured that by the time that current gets into your body through the skin, it's five millionths of an amp. Five millionths of an amp. By the time it gets on the skin, it's five thousandths of an amp through this circuit. And it's five volts by the time the battery gets through there. So that's very little current. You have to put it against your lips to feel it unless you're energy sensitive when the battery's turned on. And uh, so that little tiny bit of current ionizes the entire inside of the body, all the body's fluids. And when you ionize an environment, you make it impossible for pathogenic organisms to live within that environment, and they fall apart. And that's what the picture of the worms demonstrates better than anything I can say. And I'm glad my wife's here, because the same thing happens in the atmosphere when you ionize the atmosphere. The smog disappears, and that's why there's hardly any smog in Los Angeles. That's why there's that smoke from the fires is staying compact and blowing down wind instead of spreading out like it used to. And that's because there's thousands and thousands of little organized devices around Los Angeles. And it happened five years ago, mostly one guy, Don Bradley. And Andy Schwarm, who's filming this, had been selling cloud busters to people since seven years ago. There's a whole bunch of those around here, too. This is all Wilhelm Reich's technology. It's based on his technology. And my wife is psychic energy sensitive, and she made it possible for us to do this together. So maybe she'd explain how the organite works. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. And did I answer your question about the? Did I answer your question? Yeah, it's helpful. Thank you. Oh, is there anything else that I didn't cover? Well, I'm curious to know how the viruses or the bacteria are blown apart or. Oh. I get it. Well, in, in my understanding, it's not the frequency that's doing the work. It's the ionization process. Once you introduce electric current into any part of the body, it distributes throughout the body and creates a, a negative charge static field. Uh, all pathogenic organisms create and maintain a positive charge static field, which means there's a deficit of ions. And when you introduce ions, <coughs> it causes their skin to disintegrate and they fall out of colloidal suspension. Smog is a colloidal suspension of toxic particles in a positive charged static field. So when you introduce ions, like after a lightning storm, all the smog disappears for a while because you've introduced ions to the atmosphere and it reverses the charge of those toxic particles and they can't repel each other anymore and so they fall out of the sky. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's okay. And uh, I'll say something about Occam's razor, which is popular notion that scientists should always look for the simplest possible explanation. What you'll find in electromedicine is that most of the scientists that talk about it will look for the most complicated explanation, and they'll religiously stick to it and ignore every rational consideration. So Occam's razor becomes like a, a, a threatening weapon to them. And 
And for a person that wants to know the truth or wants to be empowered by simple truths, it's good to ignore academia sometimes. <laughs> and I guarantee you, the real scientists who work for corporate and for the CIA, they ignore academia. And they're getting results. Not very nice ones, but, you know, that's real science. So what about the organite? Okay. About that? You want to talk about that, girl? Here's okay. the genius. Uh, the organite in, in the zapper, the main reason we put the organite in there is because it absorbs any kind of negative or disharmonious energy in the body so that the body can heal. It mainly helps the body heal on a cellular level because everything else kind of melts away. So it just makes it that much easier. And, and the, the magnet is uh, wrapped around, or it's inside of uh, a Mobius coil which creates chaotic energy, the Mobius coil does. But we've put a perimeter wire around there to, and what that does is it contains that chaotic energy and the neodymium magnet in there forces that energy into the body. So that's why when people put the zapper on, the first thing they notice is that they feel energized, they feel an up. Well, it's because of the, the subtle energy devices that are instilled into the zapper. That's, that's what helps, and, and those are mainly uh, to help the body heal. The, the, the circuit and the uh, voltage that goes into the body kills all the parasites and, and you know, viruses and bacteria that's in the body, but, it all, but all the subtle energy device, devices inside there help the body to heal after that's done. So it's, it just it feels really good. You know, it, it not only you know, heals the body, but it just feels really good. That's okay. We've got some questions out there. Let's go. Someone who's not asked a question this whole weekend. Somebody brand new. Okay, you. Yeah. Could you maybe speak about the genesis of uh, organ technology and maybe what turned you into uh, or tuned you into Wilhelm Reich in the first place? Oh, thanks a lot. He asked about the how did organ technology get started and what got me into it or us into it really. Well, Wilhelm Reich was the first scientist to quantify this ether and to do experimental work with it and to produce results. And he started that in 1935 after his mentor, Sigmund Freud, blackballed him from the psychiatric community. And the reason Freud did that was because Wilhelm Reich kept healing people who had mental illness. And the way he did that, he was convinced them to start having sex with their mates again. And they'd start being angry, stop being depressed, and, and uh, they quit coming back to the psychiatrist. And that infuriated Freud. So he couldn't practice medicine in Europe, so he became a biologist. And he couldn't do anything in Austria or Germany because he was hated so much by all the shrinks there. So he went to Denmark, started his biology experiments, and he, I'll keep it kind of short, but he heated up some beach sand to incandescence because he had a feeling that life generated itself from nothing. He just had a feeling about that. He wanted to prove it. So he took some beach sand from the beach in Denmark, heated up red hot, put it in a um, sealed container so there was no outside contaminants, and let it cool. And when it was cool, he put some of the sand under a microscope, and it was teeming with life, with microorganisms. Now, Chad had mentioned pleomorphosis last night. And I so much wanted to comment on some of these great things that you guys were saying, but uh, Royal Raymond Rife invented a microscope that could see viruses. It, it was better than the electron microscope. It was suppressed by the government. He was blackballed, uh, but um, he produced a huge amount of work. So a lot of frequency discussion that electromedicine people use is from him, mostly plagiarized. And uh, his stuff is the real stuff. If you go to him, you're going to cool stuff. But he filmed viruses changing into bacteria and vice versa, fungi. And each one of these organisms with his microscope, it showed the energy field around it. It was a blue organ field. He didn't call it that. A lot of people who research this call it by different names and, and it's confusing. And, and Reich was the first one, so I, I, I think he can be excused. But it's prana, chi, life force, animal magnetism. These are all the same thing. It's the ether. Um, Tesla called it ether. It's, it's pre-existent. It's before matter of energy. It's the foundation of everything else. And when you work with that, you're getting to the root. You know, you, you can make some things happen. It, it, there's no end to what you can do and what's been done. So um, 
And as to Sacred Steve's comment about a parasite turning into a, a helpful organism, I, I don't know, maybe that happens. It's intriguing. And I'd love to see some evidence of that. That would be very encouraging. Um, anyway, so I, I studied Reich's work. Because I, I did a lot of reading at one point. I got a box of books from somebody. So I started, I got a book uh, by Serge Kahili King on called Earth Energies and told how to make organ accumulators with layers of saran wrap and aluminum foil. And so I started doing this and I made all kinds of configurations. I, I worked with people who had were psychic or dowsers and, and they would tell me how to make these things to help them do better work. And that's how I met Carol. Uh, I took her a, a, a organ accumulator cube and exchange for a psychic reading when I first met her. <laughs> was it the zapper or the organ accumulator? It was a uh, zapper. OK, well, the second reading. And she said, wow, everything looks clear. I can see, I can focus better. I can see more stuff. Everything's brighter. And uh, that's the effect of orgone. Because orgone is, is the radionics, magic, everything works through orgone. And so does radio, by the way. And Tesla knew that. It's not about anything but orgone, ether. And uh, so uh, I, I could do all kinds of things. I, I built one I could lay down in, and it was just amazing. You know, like a big coffin. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I was working outside a lot. I was a sign painter in those days. So I, in the winter, I get hypothermia. I laid down this thing in 10 minutes, I was sweating. But I was sweating, I was hot from the inside out, like a microwave oven or something. But it's entirely harmless. Okay, in 1998, um, one of my Zapper customers emailed me, and he was pretty mad because he sent Carl Welts 500 bucks for a little block of material that was only made of resin and metal particles. He was furious, you know? He wanted his money back. And I thought, oh, this, this is interesting. I'm going to try that. So um, I, I made some molds. And I had my, my daughter was psychic. She was living with me at the time. And I asked her to look at the energy and tell me what she saw. And she saw this huge, blasted out field of blue energy from this thing, much bigger than an Oregon accumulator. And so I thought, well, what if I put a crystal in here? So I put a crystal in another one. And she saw the energy shooting out the crystal. And when I pointed it at things, it would affect whatever I pointed it at. And so that was another seminal discovery. And, uh, when Carol and I got together, we started experimenting on the environment. And she can talk about that better than I can. <laughs> well, she, she's a, she's, she, she gets in party mode. She talks a lot, but she's a general. <laughs> but my wife sees elemental. She talks to them. She reads, she's telepathic. She can get out of her body, go in the past or future. She's one of the really good psychics that's I'm very humble. And, and it's one of the things that attract me to her. The arrogant ones, I, I can't really, you know, don't have much use for her. But um, there are a few like her. And, you know, through the internet, we're finding more. And when you get some humble psychics together who will work together, there's an awful lot you can do to make the world better. So. These discoveries are so huge. And all of us that do this, there are thousands of us that do this stuff. None of us have an inkling of how big this is, you know? I mean, you, you may have seen the sylphs in the sky yesterday over the forest fire, OK? Sylphs have not been seen since before radio, since about the time when radio was invented, early 1900s. What are sylphs? Right. Sylphs are they're cloud forms that look like angels. Oh, yeah. And you know, my wife said, hmm, those are angels. I thought, oh, I, maybe. There were, uh, here years ago, you guys remember, the skies were totally whited out, you know, and there, you know, we everybody was so down. Now there's beautiful blue skies, you know, and we've got the puffy clouds back, and and the frequency has risen, you know, because people are taking charge of their lives and changing their diets and changing the way they live and living more of a natural life. And that that's, yeah, it goes right along with this organized stuff, you know, with us gifting it and everything. We've changed the total frequency of the planet, and the angels are able to show themselves again. You see these huge 
clouds with these big spread out wings, you know, and you think you rub your eyes and you're looking at that and you go, man, that looks just like an angel's wing, you know, and you know what? It is. It's their way of showing us that they are back, that they're here to help us, you know, and, and it's just phenomenal and overwhelming, you know, and it's hard for us to believe, you know, that, that we're actually seeing what we're seeing, but believe me, you are seeing what you're seeing, that the angels are here to help us and they're making their presence known, and this is a time of change. And it's just phenomenal, and it's just such an honor to be here at this time. And everybody says, well, this is the, you know, this is the end times, you know, we're coming up to the apocalypse, and I just want to take them and shake them, you know, and say, hey, you guys, what makes you think that this is the end times? This is just the beginning. You know, this is, this is where everything starts. Thank you guys very, very much for being here. It's just uh, a tremendous honor to, and to all the products that you've created over the, over the years. Thank you very, very much. Um, let's big round of applause for Donna Calcroft. Because my dowsing was never very consistent, I kept, especially when it was for personal things. When you're dowsing for towers, things like that, it's not personal. You're just looking for information. You don't have a vested interest in the answer. So it, you usually get better results. But here, here's what happened. Now, when I, when I was dowsing without the pendulum, without the sucker punch, I asked Carol to watch my energy. But I watch my energy now, so I asked me a question. That's no, you ask a question. Okay. I'll ask a question. Am I a dork? No, that's that's too general. <laughs> Am I uh, explaining Don Croft? So, okay. I got a yes. Now I'm going to ask Carol to watch the energy and see where this energy is coming from to get the an answer. And if you people watching it are psychic, they'll probably see the same thing. Because that, that carries through a digital film. Okay, where's the energy coming from? From up, up above your head. And where's it going? To the top of your head, okay. down, down your arm. Okay, and then out to the muscles mm -hmm. control Okay. Does it go to the pendulum? No. Okay, interesting. Okay, now. Well, actually, it does because it's, it's surrounding oh, okay. this part of your arm, your okay. hand. But sometimes um, uh, with people too, I've seen it come down through the crown of the head to the heart uh -huh. and out this uh -huh. way. 
And that's, that's, that's not happening right now. That's someone who is well trained. Okay, got it, got it, got it. So the heart is a kind of cleans the information. Out. Right. Got it. So, uh, so to, do it, to do it right, you should bring it here and, it, and then bring it down. Uh, or let me see if I can bring it down. Okay. Uh, um, uh, Emily Doncroft. Okay, I've got a big knife here. Focusing my heart. You see in that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it, it makes a difference what this is made of, right? Mm -hmm. But it, because you interact with Actually, it doesn't make a difference. I mean, it's anything with a weight. You can use anything. Oh, yeah. anything. I used to say use a bullet. Yeah, you Just can use anything. Okay. <coughs> okay, now. <laughs> this is uh, Andy's, one of Andy's uh, power ones. Andy Schwarm. Gorgeous, yeah. You gotta say who it is. Oh, Andy Schwarm of ctbusters.com who's filming it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And this has a point of uh, a sucker punch is basically a, a very minimal device. It has a Mobius coil around a crystal and it's powered by um, an off and on circuit. We use 15 cycles a second approximately. And so this is the point. And a sucker punch isn't as complicated as this, obviously. This has a lot of other stuff in it, but it operates in this case like a sucker punch. So, uh, I'm putting the palm, my palm over the point. This thing is turned on. Okay, now I'm going to ask the question and have Carol watch the energy dynamics and describe it. Okay. So, uh, am I a sissy girl? Okay, good to know on that. Okay, so where's the energy point? <laughs> it's interesting, it's coming down. Coming down through here, going down both arms. Where is it coming in? Through your head. Oh, okay. Let me ask a more serious question. Um, oh, did we disable those four mountaintop arrays today? Okay, it, this is now it's coming through here, around and through this. Okay. So it's bypassing your head. Is what it's doing. Okay. Now, is it involving my heart? No. Okay. And here's the thing, you can get a good answer without worrying about whether the heart's having an input, right? You can, yeah. This way, this yeah. way. But it's more difficult to get a good answer this, when you're This not. takes out the pers your, 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 your personal stuff. This takes your brain out of the loop, yeah. right? And the brain is full of filters and prejudices mm -hmm. and desires. And okay, thanks, Annie. Let's see, what else you need? Well, let's talk about more about dolphins, because a lot of people are having dreams. These are people who never even see the ocean, but they're getting very specific dreams in which dolphins show up, or visions. Andy's had dolphin visions. Mm -hmm. the state, for instance. And they show up, and, and that always means something, but it's not necessarily a verbal communication. Right? So, what can you say about that? Well, Pete, you have to, people are, are, are becoming aware in, you know, mass proportions right now. And I think that has to do with what the dolphins are. But the dolphins come to you when you reach a certain s stage. That's what I've seen more often than not, but that doesn't always, it's not always that way. They, they come to other people too. But, and they relate to you through your emotions. <laughs> 